Diaspora Institute. And I introduce you to Lumumba Akamole Bandela. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Peace. It's really good to see you all. It's good to be back here on campus. Um, I want to, first of all, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you did, 69. I'm not sure if you understand how much your actions have informed, have inspired, and continue to energize generations beyond me. So thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I wanted to say, first of all, that um, as a student here at City College in the 90s, we were on another wave of student organizing, and Ron McGuire did a very good job of talking about what was happening. Um, and I was actually very much influenced by many of my instructors, some of who aren't here. Um, I had the pleasure of studying under Dr. Vivian Green, Professor Kamal Nanweri, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who's here, Professor James Smalls, who's here, and also, I don't know if you remember, but Professor Charles Powell was my instructor also. So, you've touched us. You've touched us. Um, and so I was a part of some of the organizing that happened here on campus in the 90s, but it's important to know that that was not my first uh, take at organizing. Uh, as was said, um, I come out of a historic Brooklyn-based organization called The East. Many of you may be familiar with The East, and some of us in here are East family members. This year is also the 50th anniversary of the founding of The East. So I'm going to ask the East family members that are here to please stand. I will call you out. <laughs> From uh, Pia, she just stepped out. My children are here, but yes. And so, Many of you are familiar with some of the work of the East, and so I come out of that. I'm a product of the East. One of the things the East created was a school called Yuhuru Sasa Shule, Swahili for Freedom Now School. This is my classmate over here. <laughs> we went to that school, I went to it from birth till about nine and 10 years old. Every day at Yuhuru Sasa Shule, we did a pledge, where we pledged our life to the Black Liberation Movement. I want you to understand what that prepares you for. From birth till I was about 10 years old, I pledged to contribute to the Black Liberation Movement. We sung freedom songs in the morning when we got there and when we left at the end of the day. I want you to understand the kind of institutions that were created and the impact that they had. So when I left Yuhuru Sasa, I went to the New York City Department, as they say, of miseducation. My first act as a fifth grader at the public school, 44 in Central Brooklyn, was to correct my teacher who, and I came into school right during the uh, Black History Month, and here's a young brother from Yuru Sasha Shule coming into public school, and this white woman from Long Island is gonna teach me black history. And so, of course, her discussion was limited to, you can name them, Dr. King, you had Frederick Douglass, and she ended up throwing Abraham Lincoln in there too. And so when I raised my hand and said, well, what about all of the other black leaders? And I started naming some of those names. She said, I have no idea what you're talking about. This is who was instructing us. These are the people that were instructing us. So I had to bring my father in. I moved on, I went to Martin Luther King High School where we organized and we were able to successfully remove the Air Force ROTC out of a school named after the King of Peace. We were able to successfully establish a black studies class. Imagine that. Martin Luther King High School did not have a black studies class. So we were able to establish that. So I want to share a few things before I leave. First, to those of you who were part of the takeover, again, thank you. But as been said over and over again, the conditions that gave birth to the reason you occupied this building exist today. The reasons that gave birth to the reason that you occupied this building exist today. And so we ask you not to retire or move on. In fact, we ask that you share your information. 
I'm glad to hear that there's a documentary that's being created. Very important. Young people all over this country need to hear this. Second, I ask that you hold on. Hold on to the principles that guided your work, the principles of empowerment, and recognize that a shift occurred in 2014 in this country. Young people from all over this country took to the streets after the killing of Eric Garner and after the killing of Michael Brown, and I saw courage, creativity, and commitment. And so I actually want to push back on some of the things that were said earlier. I travel across this country as part of my job to organize people across this country. And I've seen courage and commitment and creativity in some of these people that I need to make sure you know exists. You're not sitting on me behind not doing anything. You're not detached. So I want to be very clear about that. Some of the critiques that they were forced to have when these uprisings occurred was that these young people are not organized. These young people have no leadership. They have no demands or agenda. Some of the faith-based people even said they have no spiritual grounding or direction. All of that was false. What else, other than spirit, can have unarmed young people stand in front of tanks day in and day out for months? What else, other than spirit, can have young people challenge a militarized police force who are shooting live rounds at them and come back the next day? What else, other than spirit, does that? So I want to really be clear that we need to change what we think spirit is, because I've seen spirit. <coughs> Contrary to popular beliefs, the movement that exists and that was started in 2014, or rebirth rather, is organized, structured, and they do have very clearly articulated, articulated and a comprehensive agenda. I charge everyone here, I'm, I'm an educator as well, so I teach community organizing, I've taught black studies here, so I'm an educator, so I'm giving you an assignment. So that you walk out of here knowing and you do not repeat misinformation, there is a very comprehensive agenda that was established in 2016. The Movement for Black Lives Policy Agenda is directing the work of young black and Latino and Asian people from all over this country. And it's up for you to look at and read. I challenge you to look at policy.m4bl.org. Policy.m, the number four, bl.org. Learn about that comprehensive agenda that does exist. The idea that you did not see the leadership, the idea that you think it was unorganized was because it was not looking like what you were familiar with. It was not what you were familiar with. When I went to Ferguson, the leadership that I saw were young women, students, LGBT people, gay folks. It was homeless people. It wasn't what you were used to seeing. We're used to seeing, if we're quite honest, Black man with a mic, if we're honest. So because it didn't look like what we were used to seeing, we thought it did not exist, it were organized. They had structure. Because they didn't have one leader, we thought it did not exist. They intentionally have decentralized collective leadership. It's intentional because we actually learn. So again, I challenge you to fix what your narrative, your framing is about what this movement is today. It's not perfect. I'm not saying that at all. But it exists. There are young people who put their lives on the line all across this country. And I want you to know that. I want you to know that. It's absolutely important. Third, those of you who occupy professional positions in higher ed, I ask that you continue to look at yourself in the mirror. I ask that you make sure that you are showing up as a student-centered professional. I ask that you make sure you do not turn into the professors that you were complaining about 50 years ago. <laughs> if you're an administrator, I ask that you make sure you do not become or reflect that of the administration that you were fighting 50 years ago. Continue to look at yourself in the mirror. I'm a bridge. 
I consider myself to be a bridge. I come out of the black power movement. So I'm in this little, I'm not a young person, right? But I'm in a space where I understand what it was like. I know the stories. I was actually in the rooms when the meetings were happening. I was there. My childhood was not like a regular childhood. I didn't go to baseball games with my father. Some of you may remember I was actually at my father's side during demonstrations, during rallies, during takeovers, all of that. That was my childhood. So I know much of what it is we're talking about, but I also know what exists today. So I want to make sure that I connect both of those. Because young folks, actually, sometimes when y'all were there, think they know it all. And if you're quite honest, when y'all were doing this, y'all thought you knew it all too. Right? Yes. But I consider myself a bridge, and my task that I greatly embrace, really, is to make sure that young folks know. <laughs> Lastly, the current, to the current students that are in the room, we appreciate you. We need you. Know that this is a marathon and not a sprint. As a child growing up in a movement, commitment to struggle was exemplified by sacrifice. Sacrificing your time, your family, and your health. We learned the hard way, but that's, that's not sustainable, and it's not the right way. So we ask that you reframe what your commitment is going to be, and also recognize that what you have established as a part of a culture in terms of self-care is revolutionary. Making sure that movement spaces are safe and comfortable for children is revolutionary. Making sure that leadership is reflecting all of our communities, women, gay folks, Everybody is revolutionary. It's revolutionary. We have to take care of our health. We have to take care of ourselves. Just earlier this month, this week, we buried one of my mentors and a man who participated in the student takeover at Amherst by the Stan Kennard. Some of you may know his work as the founder of the Carnegie Woodson Center for Cultural Literacy in uh, Brownsville. Baba Stan passed away. But he is part of a long list of mentors that I have studied under who worked themselves to an early grade. Baba G2 Way you see? Yes. Safia Bukhari, Richie Perez, Chokwe Lumumba, I can go on and on and on. We have to change the culture of how we organize. It is, it is a marathon and not a sprint. So, as I always say, I am not down. I do not despair in what exists today. As I travel from Ferguson to Baltimore to Chicago all over, I am inspired. And I want you to know that sincerely and genuinely, I am absolutely inspired. And I have no doubt in my mind, none whatsoever, that victory is certain. But victory is certain if we make it certain. And it requires us to do what you all have done and what you must continue to do. And that is organize, organize, and organize. Thank you so much.